Well, I want to welcome everybody back to uh, the next segment of uh, Medical Aspects. And what we're going to do in this segment, it's kind of a corny tie-in, but it's, uh, this really is your brain on drugs, um, a very uh, uh, kind of stylized view, but uh, I think there's a lot of good information in here. We can look at this again in an education setting, but it, it has uh, a lot of uh, 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 importance and, and, and power done in a treatment setting uh, in, a, in a relapse prevention group, and you'll see as we go through uh, some of that as well. So anyway, to start off with, um, those of you who have been with me before or been with me for a while, um, have been introduced to my little brain guy here. He shows up uh, from time to time in treatment uh, sessions and in education uh, sessions. He's kind of gotten to be a, a, a staple around here. I use him in a lot of, a lot of different uh, ways. In fact, I always tell people I've got a, a grandson that uh, he's seven now. But uh, when he was about two, the first thing he ever learned how to draw was the little brain guy. He would come in and draw little brain guys all over the board and all over paper at home and everything. So uh, this guy's kind of got, got, a, got a reputation all his own. So anyway, if again, if you've never been with me before, you're going to find out fairly quickly that my artwork leaves a lot to be desired. So you have to use your imagination with this. If you take the human brain and you cut it in half doesn't look a whole lot like this, but it kind of, I think, gets the point across, okay? Very often the brain, if you slice it in half, has been compared to cutting an onion in half. If you look at the outer layers of an onion, they're large, and the closer you get to the center of the onion, the smaller and more compact and tighter uh, they are. The brain's kind of designed that way too. The outer layer is the largest part, and the closer you get to the center, the smaller and more compact the, the area becomes. Well, what we're gonna look at for uh, most of what we're gonna, gonna uh, do here, I'm gonna focus on that outer portion. The outer portion of the brain is called the cortex. And the cortex, again, is kind of that large um, portion. A lot of people know exactly what the cortex looks like, even if you didn't know the, the name or the term for it. If you ask most people to describe the brain, very often what you'll hear um, gets compared to a prune, uh, to a raisin, to a football with the air let out of it, something very uh, wrinkly and, and that type of thing. Well, those wrinkles are called convolutions. And the convolutions are very important because a lot of information is stored in there. And the convolutions, that wrinkly part that you see on the outer part of the brain, that's the outer edge of the cortex. So you have, it's a large uh, of area, uh, not only mass uh, surface area, but it's also large in terms of how deep it goes. Well, again, the cortex is responsible for a lot of things that are very, very critical and important to day-to-day -day, uh, functioning, day-to-day -day problem solving. For people in recovery, this is a huge issue because it certainly is important to day-to-day -to -day sobriety and gaining and maintaining sobriety. And you'll see that here in a few minutes as well. The cortex, again, like I said, is responsible for hundreds and hundreds of things, but there's six things we're gonna focus on in this, this segment. The first thing that's housed in the, uh, in the cortex is reason. And reason is the ability to know right from wrong, good from bad, true from false, that type of thing, okay? Also housed in there something we call judgment. And judgment is the ability to make a decision based on reason. In fact, you all know the term, you use it every day. When you make a decision based on reason and judgment, those two things together are called rational thought. So if somebody asks you to make a rational decision about something you need to do, in your life in general, at work, at home, in school. You make it a rational decision, you're using reason and judgment. You're using the cortex, okay? Another thing that's housed in the cortex is some control 
over motor skills. Now, other parts of the brain are involved as well, but motor skills, your sense of coordination, you know, reaction time, that type of thing, those are all housed in the, the cortex as well. Another thing that's important, short-term memory is housed in there. And short-term memory is your ability to recall things that just occur, that have just happened, okay? I use this as a kind of a silly example too and I don't mean it to sound the, the way it might sound. Um, I don't have this kind of power. But as an example <coughs> excuse me, of short-term memory, whether you want it or not, everything that I'm kind of yakking about here is going into your short-term memory. You can't stop it. Okay? What you have some control over is if this stuff is important to you, over the course of you know, the next couple of hours, next couple of days, it's going to find its way into your long-term memory and it's going to be part of your skill set and what you know and that type of thing. If this has no bearing on your situation or life at all, probably by the time we finish this and you head to the parking lot, before you get to your car or truck, it's going to be gone. The brain says, well, that was nice to know, but I don't need to know it, and psh, out it goes. So short-term memory is kind of your clearinghouse. It decides what, to, what goes, what stays, that type of thing. Control over <clears throat> what's called base emotions is housed in there. Okay? Anger, fear, control over those things. Okay? Also housed in there, something that we refer to as sense of self. Okay? Sense of self is... Can you stand what you're looking at? Okay. Positive self things like self-respect, self-esteem, self-confidence, things like that. Okay. Just that, that what makes us up. Okay. <clears throat> now, like I said a few minutes ago, there's a whole lot of other things that are controlled by the cortex. But for what we're going to look at, and especially if we're looking at it in a treatment setting, these six things are paramount. I mean, they're huge in terms of not only being able to uh, gain sobriety, but also being able to maintain sobriety, okay? When we look at reason and judgment, it's a decision we have to make whether I get sober or not. Again, going back to the old is I is or is I ain't. Uh, that's what we use to determine that. We use rational thought, okay? All these other things are very critical. What happens is the first part of the brain that alcohol in particular has an impact on is the cortex. So the first thing we start to lose, the first abilities, the first situations that we start to lose are these things here. We see it in a treatment setting all the time. But sometimes in the education groups, I've had people say, well, you know, I'm not an alcoholic, I'm not a cocaine addict, and, you know, that's never happened to me. And I tell them, you know, I beg to differ, because you can take that person's, and again, I'm not making fun, don't want to make it sound like that. I'll ask the question, if somebody brings that up, go back to the event that got them here, okay? Got a DWI, got a possession charge, got whatever it might be. Okay. I can guarantee that, let's say you were going out to dinner or you're going to a ball game or some event. Okay. Most people, before you go to that event, if drinking's going to be involved, you've got a plan. Okay. If I happen to have too many, I'm going to call somebody, I'll get a ride, I'll spend the night, I'll do, there's a plan. Okay. Go to that day. And I can guarantee, if you look at your day planner for the day of the event, it didn't look anything like this. 7.30, drop the kids off at school. 9 o'clock, go to work. 10 o'clock, meet so-and-so for, you know, meeting. 12 o'clock, go to lunch, on and on and on and on. You know, 8.30, go to so-and-so's party. 
1130, get arrested. Okay? That's not part of the reason and judgment says, I have a plan. The first part of the brain that gets knocked offline is the part that controls reason and judgment. Now all of a sudden it's time and your plan just went south. Couple of drinks too many. One of the things that I love, and I won't mention the the manufacturer, but there was a, a beer commercial years and years ago that I absolutely loved. And it wasn't the commercial, it was the tagline at the end. They ran this tagline for a year or two, and at the very end of the, of the, the ad, it was kind of like their public service announcement, like friends don't let friends drive drunk or you know, that kind of thing. I loved it because the last thing they mentioned in that ad was know when to say when. And it's like, that's a really great trick because after a couple of drinks, the part of the brain that tells you when when is, is gone. That's what alcohol does best. So all of a sudden, reason and judgment, Father Martin used to talk about this all the time, reason and judgment go to seed. They're just, they're gone, <laughs> okay? Motor skills, here you are at whatever event, you had a plan, that's gone. And you decide, well, I gotta get home somehow. I can't ask anybody to drive me home, I'm the most sober person here. You know, I've never been caught before. I can see my house from here. Okay, whatever it might be. Okay. And you start to walk out to your car, and maybe you stumble a little bit, you're staggering, your gait's a little off. Okay. And we're not talking about late stage addiction, we're talking about a couple of drinks too many. Somebody comes up to you and says, you don't look so good. Why don't you stay? Why don't we call somebody? Control over base emotions has been dialed down. And the person might say, don't tell me how I'm doing. To hell out of my way, I'm going home. I'm fine. And I'm leaving as soon as I can remember where I parked the car. Or age kind of plays into this too. As soon as I can find the keys and they're in your hand. Okay? If this has happened more than once, you might even see the person sit down and say, why does this stuff always happen to me? That sense of self. We're not talking about late stage alcoholism. We're not talking about late stage addiction of any kind. We're talking about a couple of drinks too many and you start to see this whole system get dialed down. <clears throat> the difference, and again, when I do this in the education groups, the difference between their situation and my situation before I got sober what would happen is all this stuff gets knocked offline, but before it would stay there, stay offline, the person sobers up, okay, and all this stuff comes back online. So the next day, your reason and judgment's fine. In fact, it's really fine. Why did, I, why did I do that? I had a plan. What happened? What went wrong? Your short-term memory's fine. You remember everything that happened. Your emotions might still be a little bruised because you're upset with yourself and that kind of... Your motor skills, you know worse for wear. You might have a little hangover and that kind of thing, but within a couple of hours, that's gone. So in the social recreational person's situation... All this stuff gets turned down, but almost immediately after the person stops using, the next day, all this stuff comes back online. So again, they're no worse for wear. The difference is, in my situation, I would put all these things to sleep, and before they had a chance to come back online, I'd put them to sleep again. And before they had a chance to come back online, I'd put them to sleep again. So it literally got into that one step up, two steps back, one step up, three steps back, no steps up, ten steps back. Okay? Never could quite, the person who's actively using is like a dog chasing his tail. Never quite get to where it is we need to be. Okay? This is where I am, this is where I need to be. But before we could recover these functions and faculties again, we're right back down here again. Okay? 
the cruel trick of nature, or again, I like to look at it sometimes, is God has a bizarre sense of humor. The first part of the brain that gets knocked offline is the last part that comes back online. <clears throat> In recovery, is a major issue. In fact, we have a name for this. Some of you might be familiar with, we talk about post-acute withdrawal syndrome. <clears throat> what I need the most of is what I'm going to have the least of. And if I don't have it, I have to get it somewhere. I tell folks in group all the time, I'm not trying to sell them anything, but it's one of the reasons why going to meetings, going to church, going to group, going to treat is so important because we need that input from other people. If what I need the most of is what I'm going to have the least of, I got to get it from somewhere. And where I get it is from people who've been through the same thing as, as that I'm going through at that point. And then one day I'm able to turn that around and give it to the next person coming in. What I need the most of is what I'm going to have the least of. What you start to see happen as all this stuff fades away, positive self things like self-worth, self-respect, self-esteem get replaced very quickly by negative self things, self-pity, self-centeredness, self-hatred, self-criticism, that type of thing. Okay? If I had a dollar for every time I heard somebody come in to do an evaluation, to do an intake, especially if they'd had other attempts at sobriety, where they've had a period of sobriety and they went back to active use and now they're coming back. I hear all the usual stuff and then towards the end, I always hear this litany of things that really reflects this. You know, I really wanna get sober. You know, I really need to get sober. God, I better get sober. But I'm not sure I deserve to get sober. I've had so many attempts, and here I am again. Why would I think attempt number 427 is going to be any different than the other 426? We talk about this in group very often. A lot of us have such a low sense of self-worth when we first come into recovery and come into treatment. I did too. I remember walking into the first couple of meetings I ever went to with this idea of if you knew the real me, you wouldn't let me sit in here with you. And then you find out that you're not quite so bad. You're no different than most folks sitting there. But that sense of self, that self-worth, that self-respect just isn't there. And then I'd always hear towards the end of that litany, not only do I not deserve to get sober, I'm not sure I can get sober. The confidence to pull it off isn't there. So if what I need the most of is what I'm going to have the least of, I got to get it somewhere. Some of you have heard me say this a million times. If my only frame of reference, especially early on, of how good or bad I'm doing is me, I can convince myself I'm not worth keeping on this planet. Or I can look in the other direction and convince myself I'm about ready to walk on water. Either way, the same result is going to happen. If I'm not worth keeping on this planet, I don't deserve your help. If I'm about ready to walk on water, I don't need your help. And that's another Father Martin thing. He used to always talk about God Almighty didn't build us that way. You know, we need each other. This isn't a me thing. I think one of AA's greatest philosophies and slogans and, and uh, uh, that type of thing is, we can do what I can't. If I don't have a good sense of self, I got to get it from somebody. And we get it from people around us. First part of the brain that gets knocked offline is the last part that wakes itself up. We have one more little piece of this that uh, can be kind of a, a part of the trick as well. If the damage and use continues on, eventually we start to put to sleep the part of the brain that controls awareness. So now what we start to have happen is all these things are starting to get dialed down and I'm painting with a broad brush right now. We have some concern 
we start to see things slipping away and maybe I need to do something about it. Very often, and I said it too, very often I'll hear people say, well, you know, if it ever gets that bad, I'll do something about it. A lot of times it's already that bad because people wouldn't even think about what that bad is unless something's sending a signal, you might want to take a look. But very often before we get to that point saying, you know what, this is a problem, the part of the brain that controls awareness gets dialed down and it's what problem? And again, when I use this example, I know I'm dating myself too, even though I think it's still around. Um, doesn't have the following it used to, but I used to love reading Mad Magazine. And Alfred E. Newman is kind of the spokesperson for Mad Magazine. And his classic line was what, me worry? That's exactly what starts to happen. This stuff is not where it needs to be. The person's concerned. All of a sudden, this part of the brain gets dialed down and it's what, me worry? What problem? Okay. You've heard me mention this as well. One of my definitions of addiction is when the cure for the problem becomes the cause. When all of a sudden, I see all this stuff is starting to happen, and the way the active addict deals with this stuff is I guess I need to use more. In the education groups, you see this you know, example uh, often as well. If the social recreational person says, if I do this and I get this, if I don't want this to happen anymore, I'm not going to do this. There's a cause and effect. The addict says, no matter what kind we are, the alcoholic, the cocaine addict, the compulsive gambler, all the above, he or she says, you know, every time I do this, I get this. If I don't want this to happen anymore, I need to do more of this. So the very thing that we're using to fix the problem starts to create the problem. The more I drank, the worse things got. The worse things got, the more I had to drink. And the more I drank, of course, the worse they got. It becomes this vicious cycle. So now all of a sudden, the thing I'm using to deal with, I think some of this is slipping away, starts to magnify these problems. And then all of a sudden, the part that controls awareness says, there's no problem here. No problem whatsoever. Okay? The brain wakes itself up in reverse order, like I said. If it gets to this point, when a person first gets sober, I see this happen a lot too. These things aren't functioning yet. It's post-acute withdrawal syndrome. The part that controls awareness starts to wake itself up. Now this stuff isn't working, and you're aware it's not working. And very often I'll hear people say, God, did I fry myself? I knew I should have quit too, you know, sooner than I did. You know, is it too late? And I'll tell them, no, just give it some time. Okay? The old biblical, this too shall pass. This part of the brain starts to wake itself back up. It's different things for different people. People ask me all the time, you know, the time frame, how long does it take? And I know it sounds like a cop-out answer, but it takes as long as it takes. Some people, these things come back within a matter of days. Some people, it may take months. If we stay sober, you know, stop doing the things we were doing, this part of the brain will start to wake itself back up again. Okay? I had a guy a number of years ago challenge me on, on that uh, first part of sleep, um, last part to wake up. And I said, well, give me an example. He said, well, in my house, he said, uh, I go to sleep first because I have to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. He said, so I go to bed at you know, 8 o'clock. And everybody just goes to bed kind of appropriately, you know, whoever's. And he said, I'm the first one up. I'm the first one to fall asleep and the first one up. He said, so I don't get this, you know, first part of sleep is the last part to wake itself up. I said, that's a great example in that situation. The brain doesn't work that way. The brain works like a lock and a key. When you leave here in a little bit, you'll see an example of this. Okay? When you take the key to your car, your truck, your vehicle, and you put it in the door to unlock the door, the tip of the key is the first part that disappears into the lock cylinder. The tail end of the key is the last part that, that disappears. And you turn the key to open it. When you go to take the key out, the tip of the key doesn't come out first. 
the tail end comes out first. And then the first part in, last part out. First part falls asleep is the last part to wake itself up. I had a guy a number of years ago tell you a little quick story. <clears throat> Couldn't buy the fact he was brand new in recovery. In fact, it was in an inpatient setting. He'd been in treatment for about three or four days. He didn't buy any of this memory stuff. He said, my memory's as sharp as it's ever been. And he was probably early 70s. And he said, I'm just telling you. Well, I won't tell you exactly what he said, but uh, it wasn't polite. And he said, I just don't believe that. And I said, well, let me, I said, well, you know, your long-term memory, my, but you're sure. He said, my memory period is fantastic. And I said, okay. I said, we'll do a little, little experiment here. And I, told him, I said, I'm not picking on you. I just want to, you know, I'm going to prove my point now. I said, now, what I want everybody to do, and there was probably 15 people or so in the, in the group, what I want everybody to do is think of the name of your first grade teacher. And when you think of his or her name, put your hand up. Well, that was like two seconds, and everybody, including him, had their hand up. And he's looking around just kind of smug, and it's like, see, I told you. I said, Man, that's great. I said, and just, just, for, just for the sake of doing it, why don't we go around the room and, you know, who was your first grade teacher? Mr. So-and-so, Miss So-and-so, Sister So-and-so. Get to him and Miss So-and-so, just proud as he could be. And I said, Ralph, I said, that's fantastic. I, said, I told you. I said, what's the name of the guy sitting next to you? What? I said, what's the name of the guy sitting next to you? What? I said, what's the name of the guy? He said, how the hell do I know? I said, you just met him five minutes ago. His long-term memory is firing great. He could remember his first grade teacher from 65 years ago. Couldn't remember the name of the guy sitting next to him that he just met. A couple days later, he was fine, and he could remember everybody's name and that kind of... What we lose first is what comes back last. The tip of the key goes in first. The tip of the key comes out last. Okay? These are very, very critical situations for people, again, if recovery is an issue. Medical aspects in terms of just pure education, this might be nice to know stuff. Okay? For people in recovery, this in particular is a need to know. Because very often, if people aren't told about post-acute withdrawal syndrome symptoms, and these things are going to be the last things we get back, that normal progression of things waking back up again can rapidly become triggers for relapse and can send the person spiraling out of control again. Okay. First part of the brain that gets knocked offline is the last part that wakes itself up. And again, that's why we need to be around other people who've been through it to keep telling us, keep coming back. Keep working on it. It's going to get better. I went through that too. You're going to see a change maybe in a couple of days, maybe in a couple of weeks. Just keep, just keep coming. Keep doing what you need to do. Okay? This is kind of a basic overview of your brain on drugs. All drugs of choice do this. Um, alcohol in particular. If alcohol is the main drug or alcohol is in the mix, uh, we see this. But again, all drugs of choice show the same type of pattern. Okay. Reason and judgment disappear very quickly, motor skills, that kind of thing. The difference is how quickly they come back. For the social person, they come back almost immediately. For the addict, they come back slowly. Because again, the damage is greater and deeper, more frequent, that type of thing.